Daniel's example of prayer and confession. Daniel's example of prayer and confession is given for our instruction and encouragement. Daniel knew that the appointed time for Israel's captivity was nearly ended, but he did not feel that because God had promised to deliver them. They themselves had no part to act. With fasting and contrition, he sought the Lord, confessing his own sins and the sins of the people. Daniel makes no plea on the ground of his own goodness, but he says, O oh my God, incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies, Daniel 9.18. His intensity of desire makes him earnest and fervent. He continues, O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. What a prayer was that which came forth from the lips of Daniel. What humbling of soul it reveals. The warmth of heavenly fire was recognized in the words that were going upward to God. Heaven responded to that prayer by sending its messenger to Daniel. In this our day, prayers offered in like manner will prevail with God. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, James 5.16. As in ancient times, when prayer was offered, fire descended from heaven and consumed the sacrifice upon the altar. So in answer to our prayers, the heavenly fire will come into our souls. The light and power of the Holy Spirit will be ours. That God who heard Daniel's prayer will hear ours when we come to him in contrition. Our necessities are as urgent, our difficulties are as great, and we need to have the same intensity of purpose and in faith roll our burden upon the great burden bearer. There is need for hearts to be as deeply moved in our time as the time when Daniel prayed. Would you please stand with me and we'll repeat the fourth commandment? Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath, the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and The Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his word today. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Good morning, sir. Nice to see all of you today. And uh, greetings to some who, I don't know if I've seen you here before. But uh, 
We're glad that you're here today, and may the Lord bless you on this Sabbath. Um, before I begin, I would like to have another prayer, and then we will be taking a look at Isaiah chapter 6, and I'm going to kneel. If you'd like to join me, you can. Let's pray for a little, another prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much that we have the opportunity to gather here to hear your word. We pray, Father, earnestly that we will be given not only knowledge, but the experience that the word presents. We pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit. And we pray for the forgiveness of our sins. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you'd like to take your Bibles, we will be looking at Isaiah chapter six uh, today. In the book, um, Ministry of Healing, on page 500, is a statement that goes like this. It says, Christ is, is ever sending messages to those who are listening for his voice. Christ is ever sending messages to those who are listening for his voice. We have come now to a time in the earth's history where we need a much greater dependence upon Christ personally ourselves than upon others or the pulpit. <clears throat> Here's one of the reasons why. Here's one reason why. God is in need of people who not only stand in the pulpit, but of every single person who sits in the pew to be a voice for him in these last days. Amen. The world is desperately in need of the witness that God wants his people to have. And may God so help all of us in this direction. The Lord has very big plans for his people in these last days. For those who will cooperate, despite the brevity of the time that we have here in this world. The Lord has very big plans for his people in these last days. In the fourth volume of the Testimonies, Ellen White says this. It's page 93. She says this. She says, with the light of truth, with the light of truth shining, upon the minds of men and the love of God shed abroad in their hearts. We cannot conceive what they may become nor what great work they may do. With the light of truth shining upon the minds of men and the love of God shed abroad in their hearts. We cannot conceive what they may become, nor what great work they may do. Amen. 
I'd like to uh, begin this morning by reading uh, Isaiah chapter 6, and then we will, as time allows, comment on the verses. I'm looking at Isaiah here, chapter 6, and beginning with verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the pulse of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity iniquity is taken away and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. And he said, go and tell this people. Hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant and the houses without man and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there will be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten, as a teal tree, and as an oak, whose substance is in them, when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. This is a wonderful chapter. And this chapter is specifically for God's people in the last days. Now, there's a number of things going on here, okay? And let's try as much as we can to move down through these verses. Isaiah mentions the fact that he had this vision in the year that King Uzziah died. Now, I would like for you just momentarily to take your Bibles and turn back to the book of Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, chapter... 26. Now, this man's name is also known as Azariah. Uzziah is his name given here in Isaiah 6. This king reigned as king in Israel for about a period of 52 years. 
He was one, for much of his reign, he was one of the best ones they had. I'm looking at 2 Chronicles chapter 26, and I'm looking at verse 5. This is talking about Azariah. Uh, let's read verse 4. And he did, this is talking about Azariah, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He's a good king. He's a good king. Verse 5. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. In the book, Prophets and Kings, chapter 25, there is a chapter called The Call of Isaiah. And I would really encourage you to go home and read this chapter. Chapter 25, Prophets and Kings, The Call of Isaiah commenting on this chapter in the reign of Uzziah. Now, Uzziah did many things. He accomplished many wonderful things. Israel regained a lot of its preeminence amongst the nations of the world. Many, many good things happened, but especially outwardly. They had temporal prosperity, etc., but there was still a spiritual weakness there. Now, if you look at verse 15 in 2 Chronicles 26, I'm looking at the last half of verse 15, 2 Chronicles 26. It says, and his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. This man, nearly two centuries after Solomon, was like another Solomon on the throne, he really gained the day for Israel. Now look at verse 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his transgression. Excuse me to his destruction. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Um, Let me... For the sake of time, I am going to read to you some sentences out of Prophets and Kings. I'm hoping you'll catch the ideas because we've got to move on, but I want to comment just a little bit more on this man. You have the picture now. He's had a long, very prosperous reign, prospered by God. But the Bible says when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. We would call that P-R-I-D-E. And down he went. Now I'm going to read to you here from Prophets and Kings, page 304. The sin that resulted so disastrously to Isaiah was one of presumption. Presumption. Now listen. In violation of a plain command of Jehovah that none but the descendants of Aaron should officiate as priest, the king entered the sanctuary to burn incense upon the altar. Azariah the high priest and his associates remonstrated and pleaded with him to turn from his purpose. Thou hast trespassed, they urged, neither shall it be for thine honor. Isaiah was filled with wrath that he 
the king should be thus rebuked. But he was not permitted to profane the sanctuary against the united protest of those in authority. I think if you read down here, it looks like something besides maybe, was it, if my memory serves me, maybe 80 priests besides the high priest came in and pled the case with the king. They really went after him because they saw you, they, they, they were up in arms, as it were. Okay. Isaiah was filled with wrath that he, the king, should be thus rebuked. But he was not permitted to profane the sanctuary against the united protest of those in authority. While standing there in wrathful rebellion, he was suddenly smitten with a divine judgment. Leprosy appeared on his forehead. In dismay, he fled, never again to enter the temple courts. Unto the day of his death, some years later, Isaiah remained a leper, a living example of the folly of departing from a plain, plain, thus saith the Lord. God is no respecter of persons. And then Deuteronomy 15:30 is quoted. Now, if you would go back to Isaiah chapter 6, we want to look here at the context in which Isaiah receives this vision. In verse 2 of Isaiah chapter 6, it says, Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he covered his face, excuse me, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. Two to fly, two to cover the face, two to cover the feet. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Did you see how many times the word of praise was repeated? Three times. Holy, holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. Let me interpret. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's three of them. When Jesus died on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God. Twice. He was addressing the Father and he was addressing the Holy Spirit. He was the third one. He is God. First Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Now, in the, the commentary that Ellen White has on this, she says that this phrase, when the angels say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory, this was a prophecy, a prediction of what would and will occur in the future. Okay? And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Now, it says the house was filled with smoke. You know what that means, right? Huh? In incense? Okay. But, well, here's how my mind goes at it. I'm not going to argue those comments, and I like the participation, but here's how my mind goes at it. Uh, Revelation 15, last verse, 
and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his presence. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. In other words, this is an expression of the fullness of the glory of God in the temple. Okay? The temple, the house, that is the temple, was filled with smoke. Okay? Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone. Now, here's, here's what's going on. You already, we're already five chapters into the book of Isaiah. Isaiah has already had the prophetic call. He's already been out preaching. Okay? But the Lord said, now you need to come up higher. In order for you to fulfill the mission that I have for you, you must, you must come up higher. And so God revealed to Isaiah his glory. Now, in the book Prophets and Kings, she gives us a look right into the mind of Isaiah as to what he was thinking. She describes the terrible decadence and depravity that had now fallen upon Israel, both Judah and the northern ten tribes. Terrible moral condition. If you read the first five chapters before this chapter in the book of Isaiah, you'll read some very very powerful messages against sin. You know, if, if ladies today and whoever else would read Isaiah chapter 3 and just a few sprinkling of verses in the New Testament, they would not be wearing jewelry. I'm telling you. They wouldn't be wearing jewelry. In our imagination, let's imagine Isaiah's been out traveling for a few weeks and he comes home. By the way, he calls his wife a prophetess. Now, maybe she was like Holda. I don't know, but at least she was his wife. And Isaiah probably said to her, you know what, dear? He said, I've been on a route and I've been preaching in conference synagogues. And he said, I really let them have it. He said, I called the leaders in the church leaders of Sodom and Gomorrah. Did you see that in chapter 1? He said, I really preached powerfully against women's ordination. Did you see that in chapter 3? As for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. Negative. He was preaching it powerfully. Of course, he had mingled with his preaching even before this vision hope and the imitation of pardon and forgiveness. Because he quoted the Lord as saying, Come now and let us reason, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet. They shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat of the good of the land. Amen. So he had been preaching it. He was a good, faithful prophet. And when he came home, he maybe, he probably said to his wife, it's not looking real good. Israel's in a bad condition. Let me read to you what the book Prophets and Kings says. In the face of such conditions, it is not surprising that when during the last year of Isaiah's reign, Isaiah was called to bear to Judah God messages of warning and reproof. Now listen, listen. He shrank from the responsibility. 
he well knew that he would encounter obstinate resistance. You see, God's people typically and the world in general are not real good at learning from history. If Israel was smart, they would have said, you know what, we had a good king for a long time, but he was stupid at the end, and we're not going to repeat his track record, but they still didn't learn from it, and they were still rebelling against God. In fact, you read in Isaiah chapter 5, where he quotes the Lord as saying, look, I've done all these things for Israel, and look, I'm just getting these kind of results. What more could I have done for my people, and yet I'm getting terrible returns back from them? I mean, it was a challenge. He shrank from the responsibility He well knew that he would encounter obstinate resistance. As he realized his own inability to meet the situation and thought of the stubbornness and unbelief of the people for whom he was to labor, his task task seemed hopeless. Should he... Should he, in despair, relinquish, that is, give up his mission and leave Judah undisturbed to their idolatry? Were the gods of Nineveh to rule the earth in defiance of the God of heaven? Such thoughts as these were crowding through Isaiah's mind as he stood under the portico of the temple. Suddenly the gate and inner veil of the temple seemed to be uplifted or withdrawn, and he was permitted to gaze within upon the Holy of Holies, where even the prophet's feet might not enter, but he was allowed to look in. And now God says, here is a vision of my glory. Now, if you notice here in verse 5, Isaiah says this, Then said he, then said I, rather, then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For I have seen, mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The Lord was in the process of bringing Isaiah the prophet up to a working point where he could genuinely use this man in a powerful way for reform and salvation in Israel in his time. And in order for the Lord to get him to that point, Isaiah had to be struck with the fact that the very sins that he was preaching against, in a similar manner, he was guilty of those things because of his own human nature and his delinquencies in the past. You see, brothers and sisters, God cannot use in these last days spiritual arrogance to give the last loud cry message of mercy to the world. He must have a people who have bowed low before the King of Kings, who are conscious of their own humanity. I understand sometimes I think about what's going on in God's church, and it really slams me in the face, and I become Concern. Is that a weak word? Yes. But the Lord had to bring Isaiah up to the point where he could really use him. You remember after David sinned? You know, the devil got David just like he got Isaiah. Let's speculate here a little bit. The man has about 18 wives, so he's used to whatever he wants, and he sees another one that looks pretty nice. And it's very possible that the devil said to him, hey, you are the man that slew Goliath before all Israel, and went on down through the history of his life and its successes, You can get away with this one. Try it. (laughs) 
In order for the Lord to bring his people up to a working point, he must have us realize our own condition before God. After David repented of that foolishness, the Lord let him sit in it for a year and then sent the prophet along. And when David heard about his own story, he became irate. And, and uh, um, Nathan. Nathan the prophet, thank you. Nathan the prophet, David was so angry when he heard his own story. And Nathan the prophet said, you're the man. Yeah. And David just, he sunk. But... The happy thing is David repented of that sin, but what I want you to ponder for the moment is this. After David said, he said, create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me, cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Then he goes on to say, then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Brothers and sisters, the stalling point for heaven in getting this message out to the world is the unfitness of God's people spiritually in their condition at the present time. And we must have a, a repentance and a conversion like David. We must have a repentance and a conversion like Isaiah. And then the Lord's going to let this thing fly. So, Isaiah comes to the knowledge of who and what he is, and then verse 6, it says, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. It was the writings of Isaiah who lit, as it were, the fire that burned in the bones and in the preaching of John the Baptist. I want to read to you just briefly here out of Desire of Ages, page 103, where she describes now John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ. By the way, you are very well aware that this prophet is the type for God's people in the last days. Desire of Ages, page 103, it says this, With awed yet exultant spirit, he searched in the prophetic scrolls the revelation of the Messiah's coming. With awed yet exultant spirit, this man was in communion with the book of God. Desire of Ages 103. Isaiah's rapt portrayals of the Messiah's glory were his study by day and by night. The branch from the root of Jesse a king to reign in righteousness. I'm skipping now. Then this paragraph. Then this paragraph. He looked upon the king in his beauty. And self was forgotten. He beheld the majesty of holiness and felt himself to be inefficient and unworthy. He was ready to go forth as heaven's messenger, unawed by the human, because he had looked upon the divine. He could stand erect and fearless in the presence of earthly monarchs because he had bowed low before the king of kings. That's the experience we need. He looked upon the king in his beauty and self was forgotten. He beheld the majesty of holiness and felt himself to be inefficient and unworthy. He was ready to go forth as heaven's messenger, unawed by the human, because he had looked upon the divine. He could stand erect and fearless in the presence of earthly monarchs, because he had bowed low before the king of kings. Amen. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, 
and he shall lift thee up. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Now in our scripture reading here, it says, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Brothers and sisters, God is going to have a people in these last days whom he has brought up to a good, fine working point. They know who they are. They understand the sinfulness of their humanity, the weakness of their humanity, and they have surrendered everything to Christ. And he now lives in them, and he, he now lives in them, and he now speaks through them. To the point where, as it says in Matthew chapter 10, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that hour what you shall speak, for it is not, for it is not, Ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. Amen. You see, David said, after I'm converted, after you've renewed my heart, then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Woe is me, for I'm undone, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. We all need to read the book of James. You know, I deal with people a lot. You do too, right? Yeah. Sometimes I get tired of them. I don't like it when a, a wife tells me, yeah, come back. I have a product to sell. Come back at such and such a time. Oh, sometimes they're not there. That's, you know, happens. But, but I'll come back. She said, oh, my husband's not ready yet. Come back again. And then I'll come back again, the husband say, well, we're not interested at all. You know, this week I'd had a long day. And I'd knocked a lot of doors. And I talked to a lot of people and some of them I didn't like. God have mercy on me. Don't get me wrong. I love people. The Lord has given me a love for people. I'm just saying I'm not where I should be, okay? So this lady comes out the door and she, and she said, well, you know, blah, blah, we don't have time. And I said, fine. I said, but ma'am, I said, are you really interested? She said, well, yeah, I'm really interested. Okay, fine, good enough. So she went to her husband, he was on the phone. And um, he said, oh, he, he didn't tell this to me, he told her to tell me this. He said, oh, he said, he said, ah, there's no way I'm gonna pay such and such amount of money. He said, but you can come back and show it to us anyway. And I was, nice about it, if I could say I was nice about it. But I said to her, I said, ma'am, and I said, I'm sorry your husband has made a decision already and he does, hasn't even seen the product or heard the presentation. I regretted those words. You know, sometimes we just have to bite the lip. Brothers and sisters, we got to remember this one thing. And by the way, I went back to that house. No one was home, but I left him a book and I left him a note and I apologize for being less courteous than I should. And that's not the first time. There's been a few times over the years when the Holy Spirit said, go back, you need to apologize for what came out of your tongue. Let me share something with you. We are up against some formidable opposition in giving the last message to the world. And unless... We are dead to self and alive in Christ. We're not going to fly. We're not going to make it. We have yet to understand what it means to be dead to self and alive in Christ. You know, when Paul was describing to the Galatians about his conversion and to Christ and his revelations from Christ and then his call to ministry, he says, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb, in other words, he was called from his mother's womb, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Now listen to his language very closely. It's around verse 16. He says, to call me by his grace to reveal his son in me. To reveal his son in me that I might preach him. 
You see, Laodicea says to Christ, you know what, Jesus, we're doing real good. We're rich, we're increased with goods, we don't need anything. We don't need GMO food. We believe in the 2300 days. We don't eat white flour, whatever's on the list that people find dependence in, whatever it is. And Jesus says, you know what? You're not there yet. You're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Okay? We're just gonna have to admit that we gotta bow before the cross and we're not the people we should be. Let me tell you this, let me tell you this, based on the word of God, based on the word of God, once that happens, once God gets a humble people who are ever conscious of their weakness and their humanity, this thing is going to take off. But he cannot present to the world manifestations of carnal humanity, even if it's in the context of theological truth and the veritable correctness of the last day message and the three angels' messages. Are you with me? You know what? I don't like to be told I'm wrong. Well, maybe I do. It's painful. Maybe I should qualify that statement. I'm happy to know that I'm wrong because I want to change because I don't want to hang on in to anything that interferes with, with, with Jesus working in my life. Amen. And that's a process. <clears throat> he looked upon the king in his beauty and self was forgotten. You know what she says about Martin Luther in the book Great Controversy? She says he had lost sight of self. He had lost sight of self. May I use this term? I don't want to come down in the pulpit, but God's going to have a people in the last days who are Jesus fanatics. They will be so in love with Jesus that they will be dead to self. You know, she describes in 7a of the commentary, she says that even the angels around his throne, they don't even, they don't even admire one another. They're, they're so taken with God and they're so filled with praise with him that that's all they can think about. That's their joy, that's their love. The creator of the universe, the privilege that they sense and express of being in his presence, that's what enamors them. Now, Let's read verses 7 and 8. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here my send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. In other words, and this passage is quoted, I think, in Matthew 13, John 12, Acts 28. It's repeated often in the New Testament. It's a description of the tremendous, almost from a human perspective, formidable challenge of reaching the resistant human heart. Okay? It's not God that blinds people's eyes or hardens their hearts. It's humans that do it to themselves. Okay? What the Lord is doing is he's saying, look, Isaiah, I'm giving you this vision of my glory that you may be spiritually nerved up to keep going. Don't back off no matter what. Because he asked the Lord, he says, Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. Brothers and sisters, if we will keep ever in view the cross of Calvary, we will never be discouraged. Let me tell you why. When Jesus came to this world, the devil gave him the full blaze and concentration of satanic and hellish opposition way beyond anything you have ever experienced. 
And it was his design, the devil's design, to drive Christ back off this planet, back to the courts of heaven, so that you and I would perish forever. And he wouldn't back off. He says in Isaiah 51, I believe it is, therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. In the book, Story of Redemption, Ellen White says, but I saw, but I saw that if only two had responded to Christ's mission and sacrifice, that he would have gone through with the entire sacrifice for those two. You see, after this vision here in the temple, Isaiah became like Paul when Paul said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, but I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The cross was the propelling power in the life of Paul, and thus it became the propelling power in the life of Isaiah. If you want to read some of the very best material in Scripture on the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, his sufferings, read the book of Isaiah, especially chapter 53 and surrounding passages. Tremendous. Now, here's what the Lord wants to tell us. You're up against a, an apparently huge machine. But I'm much bigger. And that's why we need to see his glory. And brothers and sisters, Paul tells us, you know, if you and I had the vision like Isaiah had, it, it, would, it would probably, who knows where we would be. We would probably be completely smitten to the point where we would just not exist. I mean, wow, what glory. But let me tell you this. The vision that Isaiah received, the revealing of the glory of God, he wants to reveal to you and I day by day progressively in the study of the word because Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all with open face beholding as in a glass, beholding as in a glass in the word of God, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Here's the note that I would like to share with you. We'll wrap this up here uh, soon, uh, as quickly as possible. <clears throat> the prophet's duty was plain. He was to lift his voice and protest against the prevailing evils. His burden of soul in behalf of bearing Judah was not to be born in vain. In other words, his mission was not to be wholly fruitless. In other words, God is saying, look, you may be up against, even in the professed people of God, a tremendous challenge, but you're going to have success. By the way, brothers and sisters, God loves his church, but he loves the world too. May our mission and em emphasis be on those precious souls out there very decidedly, not just on those in the church. Now, here's a statement, 309. I'd like to read it to you, to have you hear it. The evils that had been multiplying for many generations could not be removed in his day. Throughout his lifetime, he must be a patient, courageous teacher, a prophet of hope as well as of doom. Both warning against sin and preaching the grace of God. Brothers and sisters, I am sorry to say, but in the Adventist church today, as in Jerusalem of old, there are influences now in motion in the Adventist church that will never be reversed nor turned around like it was in the Jewish church in the days of old. But out of that, out of that, there will be a remnant who will go against tide and current and they will respond to the preaching of modern Isaiahs and they will be saved.
This assurance of the final fulfillment of God's purpose brought courage to the heart of Isaiah. What though earthly powers arrayed themselves against Judah? What though the Lord's messengers meet with opposition and resistance? Isaiah had seen the king, the Lord of hosts. He had heard the song of the seraphim. The whole earth is full of his glory. He had the promise that the messages of Jehovah to backsliding Judah would be accompanied by the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And the prophet was nerved for the work before him. Did you know the opposition is good for you? Where is it in the book Ministry of Healing? She says men of power are those who have been opposed, baffled, thwarted, but they responded the right way to those opposing circumstances and they've become strong. Not enjoyable, but it's profitable. Throughout his long and arduous mission, he carried with him the memory of this vision. For 60 years or more, he stood before the children of Judah as a prophet of hope. Now listen to this. Waxing bolder and still bolder in his predictions of the future triumph of the church. Now, let's shift up to our day. I have volume four here of the SDA Bible Commentary, which has some very good things in it. By the way, not all things in the SDA Bible Commentary are good. But here's some real good things. Okay? I'm going to read it to you briefly. We're going to wrap it up with this. Uh, this is volume four, page 27, and it's an edition that's probably at least 60 years old. I got it from my grandfather who's been dead for many years. Just listen. I mean, this, this, is, this is like top of the mountain stuff. Okay? God placed his people in Palestine, the crossroads of the ancient world. And he provided them with every facility for becoming the greatest nation on the face of the earth. Christ's Optic Lessons, to page 288, is the reference. It was his purpose to set them on high above all the nations of the earth, Deuteronomy 28 and Prophets and Kings 368. With the result that all the people of the earth would recognize their superiority and call them blessed, unparalleled prosperity, both temporal and spiritual, was promised them as the reward for putting into practice the righteous and wise principles of heaven. Okay? Now, the success of Israel was based on a number of things, and I'm only going to look very quickly at a few of them, but here's some. One, holiness of character. Okay? God's not going to have in these, last pe in these last days people who are dishonest, immoral, uncontrolled in their passions, and sensuous. They, by the grace of Christ, will have overcome every sinful tendency in their lives Amen. by repeated submission to Christ. They, he will have a people in these last days that are overcomers, both of the tongue and of the passions. So they, they, it's based on holiness of character. The blessings of health, feebleness, and disease were to disappear entirely for, as the result of a strict adherence to healthful principles. Superior intellect. Cooperation with the natural laws of body and mind would result in ever-increasing mental strength. Uh, you know, Lord willing, over the next couple months, if I can, I'd like to write a 10 or 20 page paper just on this very subject because it interests me so much. If I can just get the time, put some things in print. I really believe if God's people have some right information, it can be a wonderful help to them. But the spirit of prophecy is full of good things. You don't need me to tell you something. Go right to the source. Superior intellect, cooperation with the natural bodies, excuse me, superior intellect, cooperation with the natural laws of body and mind would result in ever-increasing mental strength 
and the people of Israel would be blessed with vigor of intellect, keen discrimination, and sound judgment. They were to be far in advance of other nations in wisdom and understanding. Prophets and Kings, page 368. They were to become a nation of intellectual geniuses. And feebleness of mind would eventually have been unknown among them, gives the references. As the nations of antiquity should behold Israel's unprecedented progress, their attention and interest would be aroused. Even the heathen, this is quoting now from Christ's Object Lessons 289, even the heathen would recognize the superior, superiority of those who served and worshiped the living God. Now, bear with me just a little bit. Oh, okay. I'm reading now from page 29. These promises of prosperity and a successful mission were, were to have met fulfillment in large measure during the centuries following the return of the Israelites from the lands of their captivity. In other words, these promises of God bringing his people up to a point of spiritual maturity and excellence were to be fulfilled after they're being brought back from captivity. It was God's design that the whole earth be prepared for the first advent of Christ, even as today the way is preparing for his second coming. Again, the reference is given Prophets and Kings 703, 704. God provided Israel with every facility for becoming the greatest nation on the earth. Then it says this. Now here's another reference given. That reference was Christ's Optic Lessons 288. Now here's one from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 378. There was nothing God could have done for them that he did not do, yet they failed. Now I'm quoting, now it's quoting. Yet it was their unwillingness to submit to the restrictions and requirements of God that prevented them to a great extent from reaching the high standard which he desired them to attain and from, from receiving the blessings which he was ready to bestow upon them. I'm going to read that again. Bear with me. I will wrap this up soon. But I want to I'll leave some things here with you. It was their unwillingness to submit to the restrictions and requirements of God. In other words, they said, Lord, we don't want self-restraint. We want self-indulgence. Okay, the Lord says, you reap what you sow. That prevented them to a great extent from reaching the high standard which he desired them to attain and from receiving the blessings which he was ready to put to bestow upon them. Israel's unwillingness to submit to the restrictions and requirements of God prevented them to a great extent from reaching the high standard he desired them to attain and from receiving the blessings he was ready to bestow upon them. They cherished the idea that they were the favorites of heaven. Prophets and Kings, page 378. Christ's Object Lessons, page 294. They cherished the idea that they were the favorites of heaven. Okay, so they failed. Now, Listen to this. Watch this. Prophets and Kings, page 713 and 714, it says this. That which God purposed to do for the world through Israel, and I'm telling you, there's more statements like this. Here's just one. That which God purposed to do for the world through Israel, the chosen nation, he will finally accomplish through his church on earth today. Here's the question, are you willing to cooperate? When Jesus says you need to think different, act different, do different, are you willing to say, Jesus, I love you so much, Take me all the way, right? I'll read one more and I'll be done. This is the book, Publishing Ministry. I'm looking at page 80. Uh, for those of you who don't have that book, it's 5T, 554, 5T, 554. If all that the Lord has spoken in reference to these things had been heeded, our institutions today would occupy a higher and holier position than they do. 
In other words, if she's saying if you would have listened to the instructions God has given you, you would have been marvels of prosperity even in our time before the world. Okay? All right? But men have been satisfied. Now listen to this. Listen to this. We're all guilty of this, if I may speak for the congregation. But men have been satisfied with small attainments. Now listen to this. They have not sought, they have not sought with all their might to rise in mental, moral, and physical capabilities. They have not sought with all their might to rise in mental, moral, and physical capabilities. They have not felt that God required of this of them. They have not realized that Christ died that they might do this very work. They have sought, not sought with all their might to rise in physical, mental, and spiritual capabilities, mental, moral, and physical capabilities. They have not felt that God required this of them. They have not realized that Christ died that they might do this very work. Now I have four Bible verses for you to memorize. Okay? I'm making it easy. If you want to, go for 400. In fact, I would encourage it. Here's four Bible verses for you to memorize. Okay? The lead text is Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sub with him and he with me. Okay? First verse, that's the lead one. Okay? Now, we're going to backtrack to the book of Galatians and come forward again. Galatians 2.20. You know the verse? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay? Tremendous. Brothers and sisters, if you can memorize those texts even in one reading, they will not do you the good that they will do you if you will read them over at least 100 times. I'm telling you, read them over many times. Drink from them. Okay? Now here's two more. Colossians 1, 27 through 29. Now here I'm giving you about three verses to memorize. Okay? And then one more. Colossians chapter 1, verses 27 through 29. By the way, the book of Colossians is especially for God's last day church. It says that right in the Bible. Here it is. Colossians 1, 27 through 29. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Colossians 1, 27 through 29, and we'll wrap it up on this one. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Praise God. The weakest saint can become strong. Hebrews 11, out of weakness they were made strong. Jesus had a profound interest in every man because he had died for every man. May he be uplifted upon the cross ever in our thinking. God bless you as we sing and pray to finish. Please stand with me. 
as we sing Hark the Voice of Jesus Calling. been gracious to us today. Amen. Let's kneel as we pray for conclusion. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come before thee in Jesus' name, thanking you that though we are men and women of unclean lips, that we may come to the throne of grace and have our iniquity taken away and our sin purged. Father, there are young men in this congregation. Put your hand upon them. And as Paul said to Epaphras, say unto Epaphras, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Father, there are mothers in this congregation. Give them a new sense of duty and a new inspiration to be their very best. Father, there are children, older men, younger men, and every one of them has been called to service. I pray that they will see the vision of glory and say as I did, say I did, here am I, send me. And I pray, Father, that everyone here will make that decision to follow you. We thank you that you're coming soon. Bless us now, reveal to us your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.